So, this is what I will talk about. ICT and education in general, and more specifically what people used to call e-learning and the challenges which e-learning might have to meet in the future. So I've built up these keynotes uh, as there is some interference here. I don't know why, but it's okay. Um, I have built this keynote as a kind of malerai, a more impressionistic kind of landscape painting. So, if you're a painter, the first thing you are interested in is the horizon, okay? You have to find the horizon. And if you have a photographer or a filmmaker, you'll be sure to use guidelines in your horizon, otherwise the horizon may be skewed. <coughs> so, I'm going to start or warm up with horizon. I will mainly um, relate to three kinds of horizon for e-learning, to make things a bit simpler. The first one is the, what I would call a technological horizon. And you might not need any kind of explanation. It's about things, about Geräte. I like the German word, Geräte. Appliances, things. How they work, how they function, their shape, and their place in our world, the world of things. The second horizon is education, the educational horizon, which is a bit more murky. But there is still an horizon there. The third one is what I call society and culture, because neither technology <coughs> nor education are alone in the world, but they are in a kind of frame which is a larger frame, <coughs> which is the social reality at large, and also the symbolic cultural reality, which in a way wraps it all, so that we can look at education <laughs> and technology. Can you hear me be, uh, behind there? No problem? Just stop me if there is any problem, okay? So these are my three pillars. Now the three pillars of wisdom, but at least the three doors to enter this kind of theme. So as uh, navigators, well, oh, you are not a seafaring nation. Uh, I mean, the Austrian marine is not very much uh, uh, to speak about. Uh, but at least you are uh, a Bergsteiger, so you have any kind of impression about what a horizon is, but the big one with a curve. Well, who knows from the Dachstein or the Wildspitze, you might perhaps see a kind of horizon with a curve. But uh, let's say that's coming from Norway, which is a uh, maritime nation. We are very much interested in horizon. So not horizon are that bright, especially in northern areas. They can be misty, and uh, in many cases, they are not always visible, these horizons. So looking out, looking out, aus schauen, doesn't this re-imply? Now I'm switching to technologies again. Doesn't it imply that you are a techno-optimist? You might be Christopher Columbus and see the horizon, but your assumption about what is behind the horizon might be rather problematic. It's not India, it's America. And looking at the horizon doesn't mean you need to have a need for predicting what's be or behind the horizon at the horizon. You might just look the horizon. So uh, the future might be bright, we hope, and some horizon might be actually constructed in such a way that are presented as bright. And we're used to that in the world of e-learning politics. But uh, are you sure the horizon are br so that bright? So looking out Carrying out systematic outlooks is not about telling how bright the future will be. It will be actually acquiring tools and developing a reflection to know if there are possible alternative paths trodden to this future. So horizons may be more illusion 
mirage, do you say Fata Morgana in German too, perhaps, uh, than real uh, sightings. Even visible, horizons may be too far or unreachable by the means which you have. And as we know, most of the tricky and funny thing do not happen on the horizon, but they happen on the beach, on the shore, and even in the woods behind. So a horizon line may be useful to perceive at least the difference between what is far and what is near. So seeing the horizon is not enough. You might just drown in your own visions, but the short term might be rather Actually, and this is the tricky issue, rather diesig und nebelhaft. This is what you feel about e-learning, somehow? Well, welcome in the club. So, talking about the horizon, now I will turn to the second part of my Landschaftsmalerei, which is view, the look, the outlook. So, uh, I want to travel back by my time machine to 1913 to the American inventor in the industrialist Thomas Edison. You heard the name before? Oh, there is a nice light bulb up here. Isn't it due to Thomas Edison? Probably. And Thomas Edison was actually, 1913, a very important actor in the field of developing projection of moving pictures, also called film in Europe, using celluloid strips and projecting right through them on the screen. Have you seen that before? And Edison, very early, and that's quite interesting, started in the outlook business, for Ausschauen. And his outlook was about the educational potential of moving pictures. So let's have a little retro look, back dive into past, into Thomas Edison's view about the potential of moving pictures. And quoting, quoting Thomas Edison from an interview he gave in 1913, he said, books will be soon so obsolete in the schools. You believe in his predictions? Well, 100 years after, can we see it again? Books will be obsolete, yes or no? We don't know. But people have always been projecting linearly expectations in a rather simple way, from their standpoint, for the future. I will quote, actually, more precisely Thomas Edison's uh, answers to the journalists in the New York Dramatic Mirror, July 1913, who asked him, what is your estimation of the future educational value of pictures? So the answer was, books will be soon obsolete in the public school, he said, as stated. Scholars, teachers will be instructed through the eye. It is possible to teach every branch of human knowledge with the motion picture. Our school system will be completely changed inside of, what's your guess, of this time frame? Ten years, uh, also 1923. And he gave a wonderful example from zoology and biology about the moths and the small animals and showing them that it was much easier to understand how organisms are working in their environments and all physiology from moving pictures in black and white, actually, and with a lot of uh, stripes and everything. And in the last part of the interview, Thomas Edison actually launched the idea, answering a question of the journalist, but the journalist said, but what about the people and families and the real people? And he answers, uh, well, uh, yes, there will be some uh, home cinema. We know about home cinema, isn't that? And, but I don't think that uh, everybody will have some projecting facilities in their home. Because uh, although 
the wealthier people uh, might acquire them, no doubt. Some people may not have the money to acquire them, to have a projector and film and buy film in their home. But he was seeing already, learning in home through moving pictures. But the cheapness of film entertainment is due to its popularity be with, uh, among the many. So actually, it was quite genial. Uh, genius from uh, Thomas Edison's standpoint, saying, I'm looking at the success of moving pictures in theater for entertainment, and I am extrapolating and trying to, in a way, extract from this kind of uh, enchantment. Verzauberung uh, and a kind of educational value. This was a kind of early approach to what I will later on cover in this keynote, and which I call the hype factor. So he predicted the future will see motion pictures more or less in the homes, while in clubs, in the cinemas, and in motion pictures and theaters, uh, motion picture houses, they will be most popular. So he said, OK, it will be used for education, but still, most of it will be used for entertainment. What do you think about uh, Thomas Edison's uh, Prophecy, cool, nice, not totally uh, out in the blue, but wrong. How many of you have a projecting uh, cinema in your home nowadays and watching uh, online courses uh, and buying your uh, film celluloid rolls? Very few. I remember from school, we had some 16 millimeter, uh, very boring movies actually. Uh, so we preferred actually to go to the cinema instead. But this is a kind of outlook which is produced. I'm using the one from 1913, before the war. The First World War just broke out very shortly after. So I was not much interested in e-learning a la Thomas Edison for some years. But in every generation, every five years, every 10 years, you can also follow academically, historically, uh, the evolution of such uh, outlooks for Ausschauen in the future. My point with showing this view, and I will stop speaking about Thomas Edison, it is not actually my topic, I'm sorry. It's that you, teachers, educators, decision makers, and also the non-present learners here, the pupils, the students, all of you, or all of us as a community, are bound somehow, explicitly or implicitly, with or without a very sharp awareness, we are bound to express somehow views on ICT and technologies. The problem is which kind of views do we have? So, uh, the challenge, as I see it, for educators, which is my audience today actually, in a wide sense, educators in a wide sense, is to engage in the Anstrengung, in the efforts to develop a view on technology, to reflect also on your own, on my own view on technologies, basing this view on experiences, expectations, and learning uh, from these uh, experiences. And as you know, and as I know, there are many competing views about what technologies may be. So a lot of research work, a lot of practical work is there all over the world today. Both educational planning, didactic planning, experiments, ethnographic work also, uh, observing people, participant observation, uh, flip learning experiments, you probably all of, all of you learned about it, about reversal educations, education. And the idea now is to accumulate a kind of experience capital, Erfahrungskapital, so that you can, in a sense, create, work out some distance to the notion of technology and learning. At the heart of this distancing, we will have to, in a way, relate to our own views on technologies. So actually, I would have liked, if I had time in another world, in another life, to design a kind of survey today for you, with many questions which were, in a way, 
scrambled together so that I could, not, I could trick you a little bit about my intentions. And I would like very much to have the kind of the real view you have on technology, all the 400 persons who are here today. And we could also try to match it, associate it, and display it, and talk about it. We have not the time to do it, but it would be very cool to do it. So, folks, what's your view on technology? Five seconds. What's your view on technology? Any idea? Don't answer the question yet. Answer to yourself. I will present you some options. Some options. Which you might match yourself to. Or you say, no, it's not for me. Uh, I'm somewhere else. So are you a, what I called, a techno-determinist? Nice word, isn't that? Techno-determinists, auf Deutsch. Well, te what techno-determinism, what is it? Well, to explain it simply, it is the belief that, for example, iPads, tablets, appliances, ICT, Geräte, by the grace of their inner potential and functions, their configuration, will make school learning, teaching better, for example. That pupils will become more knowledgeable. That is a kind of potential, the kinds of hidden grace to, we're in a Catholic university, a kind of hidden grace inside things, inside Gerete, which just cries for being opened and revealed to the people. And given the correct approach to this potential, this technology will, in a way, liberate people, or, for the worse, uh, destroy them. But the idea is that the real actor uh, is not uh, people, society, but that technology itself is an autonomous actor, selbstständige actor. So, reality is in technology, according to the technology determinist. It's outside humanity. It's in a way post-human or übermenschlich. And it acts upon us as a force. Um, you might be a positive techno-determinist. Like uh, the song, you have to see the bright side of life. And you have to see the bright side of technology. So you could actually be a techno messianist or messianic. What is techno Mezionism. techno mezionism is a kind of a more uh, um, strong version of uh, techno-determinism for the hopeful one, the optimist one, which uh, ascribes somehow to technology the power to liberate people in some distance or near future. So the liberation doesn't lie in people or society or culture or whatever, it lies in the kind of Alibaba jar, you know, in the cave of technology, which needs to be open and then uh, poured on the people as a kind of elixir, use water. So this is a techno -mezionism. You can, and this techno -mezionism is actually very at the heart of the discourse of, uh, of marketing. Uh, I call, for example, it for the Steve Jobs factor, which is creating hype, and hype is very much tied to discourse, which is a techno -mezionic. Um, uh, kind of discourse. You can look at the iPad and, or uh, at the iPhone or, uh, or at some other kinds of appliances. They build very much on this kind of techno messianic discourse. Do I speak too fast? Okay, good. I will be finished before my time. But uh, most of us uh, have uh, some issues. We are more pessimistic. So the third issue is you might be a techno catastrophist. Uh, sorry, some of us are more pessimistic, and uh, the future is not bright, actually. We are more in a kind of situation of Götterverdämmerung, the crisis, humanhood is going to, humanity is going into the pit, all together like lemmings, and so on. So, uh, you see in ICT and technology, but in ICT as really the representative of this kind of technology, a potential slavery and departure, uh, from either traditional views on culture and uh, teaching, 
and or if you are more in the kind of radical uh, kind of European tradition, a departure from uh, Erleuchtung, from enlightenment. So actually technology is seen as a dark force, as dark skies, as a dark horizon. And uh, it's a pr very problematic kind of view on, t on technology. So the future is basically about a catastrophe and about resisting about uh, the technological uh, uh, kind of hegemony or regime. But you are in a kind of techno-catastrophist kind of mode. Are you? Or you must say, okay, no, I'm evading all this kind of ideologies and extremist views. I'm not that childish or infantile. So I'm going to build up a position in relation, for example, to the use of technology in teaching and say, no, 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 I will be a pragmatist. But I have fundamental doubts about the sanity of the information society projects. And I tried to pose myself as an intelligent, well-educated person in the kind of Spannungsfeld tension between what uh, Jürgen Habermas, German philosopher, called a Lebenswelt, the real human sphere for communication and communion between humans, and System, the system there. So technology is in this kind of in-between area. And there is tension, but there is no catastrophe and there is no liberation in technology. But you are a techno-skeptic, are you? Is skepticism your position? Don't answer, please. <laughs> or you think you are a real smart person, smart guy, smart lady. Aha, no, I've, in some sense, uh, uh, actually, uh, I will be smarter, actually. So I will be a techno-instrumentalist. What does it mean, techno-instrumentalist? Well, I will actually uh, cultivate my neutrality. I will say that technology is nothing more than. Nothing more than. Tools, tools. So the word tools dominates all the time the ideology of the techno-instrumentalist. Instrument tools. So actually, technology doesn't want anything, doesn't have any kind of Alibaba uh, kind of liquid inside the jar. There is no demon inside the jar either. And uh, it's not very problematic in kind of tension between the system and the life world. It's just a tool, nothing else. What do you speak all about? Danger and hopes. So the reality lies outside the instrument, and the instrument has no, in a way, intentionality by itself. It is attributed a role and a function, but it's outside the tool. And it's also a view you meet very much also in ICT and education. Tools only, relax, it's not very da dangerous. Are you a techno-instrumentalist? Well, no, you said it's such too a simple view. So the sixth position, I won't torture you with more positions. It's the last one. Are you, aren't you happy, actually? It's to say, well, uh, I would prefer to look at people and interaction between people and to look at technology as a kind of byproduct of the interaction and to use a very nice word, the co-construction of reality by people. So you would end in a kind of social constructivism or techno-constructivism. It would be nice to hear from you later on, or perhaps you could do it on your own, and when listening at people or presentation or demonstration, uh, how would I position myself in relation to these views on technology, especially in relation to learning? Okay, finito. My third chapter, and I will be very, very fast with you. You've heard the word innovation, probably. Do you heard the word adoption? Not of children, but technology adoption. How do people, in a way, meet and adopt, make technology part of their life and our practice? This is a few rehearsal about some concepts here. All of you know this uh, curve, the S curve. You run it in school, the Gauss curve down. 
and the top curve, which is normally called the S curve because it's sigmoid curve. So it's about how uh, technologies are adopted. And um, Everett Rogers, who was uh, very active with this kind of theory in the 60s, has created a theory which until now has not been able to be rejected by any kind of critics. So even if it's tweaked, even if there are objections to this model, uh, one always goes back to this kind of uh, uh, basic model about how technologies and innovations in general are adopted. So you, you have this kind of uh, early period here where uh, this is an, uh, uh, very few people who adopt the technology now. How many of you have Google Glasses today? <laughs> Watching me through Google Glasses? Not one. Huh. Uh, how many of you have a kind of brain implants? Uh, not yet, okay. But if there is one, this person will be here because you are probably the designer of this system and being present here. So there are very few in the beginning. Probably the designer innovators and the fan club around. But more and more people adopt. So we have the early adopters here. People are a bit crazy and are a bit geeks or whatever. And then you have what is called the chasm. It's, it's kind of gap uh, or you could also the tipping point where things start to happen or die. So you have early adopters which are kind of front runners. Uh, not necessarily intelligent people, but uh, they are the first one who use it in, in groups and introduce it in organizations. Then you have the early majority, which are the people who start to broaden the usages and uh, embed these tools or innovations. Uh, for example, in school, universities, uh, let's say if you look at the iPads, the tablets now in school, uh, I would say that uh, we are somewhere here now. We can fight about where exactly it should be. And then you have those who have been resisting, but who are actually doing a lot of groundwork uh, to embed these innovations uh, in a narrow boring, but in a more lasting way into the organization. The last phase is very good. is those who come too late to the party, in a sense. <laughs> and uh, I have another, well, if I'm old enough, I will write the kind of continuation of this model, which is about fossilization and the sarcophage phase. How many of you are using a 16 millimeter movie projector for your lectures now? Well, if you were doing it, you'll be more fossilized, okay? And uh, this kind of adoption curve also uh, is uh, corresponding uh, to uh, also uh, the overall, uh, say, uh, dynamics of innovation. And this is about all innovation, for stupid innovations, intelligent innovations, uh, innovation for the good of humanities and for the worse of humanities. So it's a kind of neutral model. It has to do with the dynamics of adoptions. So I've been covering the hype model and with the picture of the late uh, Steve Jobs and his iPhone. Um, do you have an iPhone? Yeah, oh no, yes, how oh, many of you have actually. So you're not innovators anymore. You are in the middle of the curve. How many of you have a Walkman? A real one? One? You are a laggard. You are after the party. Do you have batteries for this and cassettes in, in shops? Do you see? Uh, but actually you could be a kind of retro modernist in the sense that you use a, an old Walkman to, as a kind of cultural statement. So it's not that simple as I'm trying to cover it. So fossilization is here. This is my own Game Boy. And it can be applied to e-learning also. There are many aspects. This is one of the pictures I took from my uh, doctoral student who is now in, uh, a professor in uh, Dresden, uh, Helge Fischer, and from his thesis. Thank you for giving me this picture. It's in, even in German, so you can read it. But it's not true today because it's moving all the time. It's only a snapshot in the theory about what's take place. So where are you there, folks? Don't answer. How does it spread? It spreads uh, socially, and then I would like to use the word weak ties, strong ties. Uh, quoting Mark Granovetter, an American uh, sociologist and ethnographer who, devised, who invented this theory in the 70s and 80s and refined them. It has been very powerful. It was de uh, developed before the internet uh, and the social media, but now it's used very much actively to uh, understand how all things spread, how things get ver viral. So the idea is that the traditional power forms, like institutional power, where you have people on the top and uh, try to push 
technologies doesn't work anymore. It's the near-to-near -near relations with local density, which today actually explain how things are spreading and adopted. I would just like you to remember a little bit this kind of model because it's quite useful to understand uh, what takes place locally. And an innovation can start locally because there are people who are in a kind of densified network and have a very good communication and make very basic experience. The most interesting, actually, case for that is the flip learning history, which is very short. It was one teacher with a baseball class of uh, pro between problematic learners who start to use video at home and reverse the teaching between classroom and uh, homework. It was not devised in the <coughs> Royal Academy or whatever, or by Microsoft or Apple. It was a kind of down on the field, met very important experience, which has spread virally because of the weak ties which are becoming strong. So the weak ties are not the department of this or this, but they are the field actors which are at work. So if we mixed all these curves, oh my god, I'm getting a headache, aren't you? Do you have some aspirin here? <laughs> this is a kind of snapshot of technology evolution with many such curves. So simple explanation, as I try to give first, can become quite chaotic when you mix all the aspects. So please, uh, don't do it to us today. So, is how you might feel when you start to deal with technologies. <coughs> there are many threads, and you try to understand and entangle all these aspects. And I think this is the experience of many teachers today, meeting all these technologies together and trying to make some sense out of it. And this is also my feeling sometimes when I work with the reports and trying to, uh, in this field, and trying to, in a way, find what's the common round of these reports. So, next pictures at an exhibition to quote a, a well-known piece of music, Wired Humans. Well, I'm one today, but uh, I don't mean wired in that sense, and I will explain what I mean by the concept of wired humans. So, a wired human is a human who, by mean of some technology, whatever, it could be a hammer, it could be a tam-tam, it could be an iPad, it could be some very funny uh, science fiction technology. It's not important, some kind of technology. What is technology? It's not, what, it's not physical, not in the flesh. It's outside, Geräte, algorithms, procedures. Human who, by means of some technology, relates, and I'm stressing the word relates, to first, and we forget always this kind of dim dimension, him or herself. Technology is not necessarily about technology, it's about relating you to yourself by means of an external uh, device. And the device is not necessarily physical. This is called uh, the kind of reflexive aspect of technology for people who want to use very complicated words. The second is to relate, not only communicate, which is a bit uh, too uh, restrictive, relate to other people, other humans, who also maybe use these devices. Haha, <laughs> it's becoming quite complicated. I will come back to this kind of complication factor. And more philosophically, or practically in the sense of transforming material, to the world of things and natural phenomena. And all of this is in the same bag at the same time, most of the time. So relate here means perceive what is present or not by means of and I have a very important word now, mediation. In German, you would say medierung or something like that. Hmm? Mediation. Mediation, yes. We cannot use this word in French, in French because it means something else. It means more negotiation. But you use the word media, mediation in German. In Norway, we say med, mediering. So every, every language has this kind of uh, homebrew for this kind of expression. So relating here is also by, by mediation, mediation. And the Gerät becomes a Zwischengerät. 
And through this, you act upon people. Even if you just speak or write on Facebook, it's an action, it is an activity. So this is my definition of wired humans. The wires are not necessarily electronic. So these are the wires. You have a person here who had one kind of media to relate to himself or herself, just for the experience, enjoying, or boring oneself somehow, but somehow you relate to yourself, so some media usage. Here's another person probably doing the same thing with another media, but the two persons are relating to each other using different media. So you need also an intermedia media to relate the two media together. This is, even if it's complicated, it is the normal situation for people to interact together, for example, on social media or multimedia, social media, Twitter, Facebook, and so on. So the reality of mediation is my, at least, my main topic of research. And we have to understand how mediation uh, influences and defines and orientates the view which individuals have on themselves, especially in learning situations. So it's not enough to say mediation. We have to do a long work to understand the implication of mediation in human culture and, uh, and learning. And it's only the beginning. We have been doing it for some decades now. But I think we have to continue for several generations before we, if we ever understand the mysteries of mediation. It's not simple. It's a tricky issue. But if you are a techno-instrumentalist, you say, ah, it's only philosophy. Mediation is only a tool. But it is not my position. It's more mysterious, in a sense. And I like mysteries. So we're living in an intermediated space. Sounds nice, isn't that? OK. So it's not as much about uh, things, Geräte, we are talking about, or even how they may function. Here we have a nice uh, monitoring system for myself designing these keynotes in my hotel. So I put some evaluator on top of me. It's not my eye, it's a kind of mediated eye, which is uh, in a way wired back to my brain and looking at what I'm doing. No, I'm kidding. Uh, so it's not about things, it's not about appliances, about functions. Because we know that technology is not ab only about simply doing things. And it is not, sorry to tell you this bad news, it is not about information, if we, even if we like the word information, but basically we don't know what information is, and this is one of my philosophical positions. Or it's not even about what information tells us, content stories, nor it is about communication, which is another funny word, buzzword I would call it, as we humans have always been communicating for eternities. So communication is not something new in humanity. It's what we always have been doing in some way or another, and even animals are doing that. And it is not communication of information by means of Greta, of appliances. What I want to do, actually, by saying it is not, is to place human experience at the center of all this space which I call the mediated space. So in German, I would put Erlebnis in the center. So what is this mostly about? It is mostly about change happening, about being uh, confronted with change. And many changes taking place, not only sequentially, but on top of each other, in, in between each other. It's also about emerging practices of teachers, of learners, politicians, decision makers, companies, and relating to these practices. And it is also about fears and hopes. Since technological evolution may act as a kind of, to use the picture for medicine, as a kind of screen on which we project fears and uh, hopes all the time. And it's very much, in my view, about speed and penetration. Because the speed and diffusion of ICT and internet and social media especially, social media is, in my view, the most interesting uh, phenomenon uh, almost in recent history, especially in the history of, of social technologies, because it has spread so fast and so 
and among so many people in so many cultures, irrespective of the culture. You might think find social media um, among, uh, let's say, uh, uh, Shia clerics in Qom in Iran as much as among Buddhists nowadays in Burma, uh, in the midst of Africa, uh, uh, in, uh, among intellectual people, it's spreading in genera among, across generations also. So this is quite amazing in terms of history of spread of social technologies. So we are interested uh, in the speed itself. I'm interested in the speed. And in the practices which emerge. And these practices are not predictable. They just emerge. You have, we have to be open for invention. Learners invent, pupils, children, kindergarten children invent, students invent, teachers invent, and all inventions in a way have to uh, negotiate with each other. There's a strong notion of invention. It's not any kind of predestination to use a theological concept. For aus Bestimmung. And last but not least, it's about the pressures or the diverse pressures put on educational systems, which are not only technological. They are cognitive, they are cultural, and they are, in a sense, existential also for the people who are involved. So, horizon uh, studies uh, are quite uh, important. I will now move, since time runs quite fast, uh, unless my clock has stopped, it's at 1.38 uh, p.m. Oh, this one is good to have. Um, I will now confront a little bit this kind of warming up with uh, a kind of uh, synthesis of four leading reports from the New Media uh, co uh, Consortium called the Horizon Reports uh, for New Media in Education. Have you heard about these reports? They are widely disseminated, referred to, but never quoted uh, very precisely. And they serve as a kind of, uh, let's say, uh, basis at least for uh, designing policies and uh, uh, putting diagnosis basically on uh, uh, what's happening within e-learning today. So I've taken the four reports covering, uh, actually this is what I'm using my weekends in Norway when it's raining, uh, taking four reports, one for K-12, uh, one for uh, undergraduate colleges, uh, one report for higher education, and one uh, outlook report for uh, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics teaching. And additionally, to crown the whole thing, the cherry on top of the cake, I've taken also the British uh, Desk uh, Research Report on the MOOCs. You have heard the word MOOC already? Anybody who hasn't heard MOOC is an, is an idiot, isn't that nowadays? Because you have to learn about MOOC. It's a kind of hype. MOOC is hype. So, well, not everybody thinks MOOCs are hype, but uh, a lot of people think that they should think that MOOCs are hype. So, taking these five reports, I've been trying to relate them to each other. So we are in the Outlook business here. You know where it is taken from? Darstein, of course. Why are you on, on this one? And uh, it's looking north or south, I'm not sure, but uh, we can discuss it after. And I'm, I'm seeing only mountains and no plains, so it's probably southward. And the sun is bright. So the first report is about K-12, the second is about uh, uh, technical and junior colleges. The third one about higher education, and the fourth one about engineering education, and then you have the British report. So this is what I felt after reading this report. <laughs> uh, sorry for the bad picture. And uh, it's perhaps also another version of my feelings, okay? But uh, these were a kind of uh, complexity in the report, and perhaps it's a false complexity so uh, never try to make sense of things which are, uh, might lack sense when you go into the details. But the nice thing about the report is that they left the kind of uh, more naive, idiotic, uh, revolution kind of approach you had in the 90s about e-learning. Somehow people have learned the lesson and they try to be careful, at least. So they are more speaking in terms of evolution rhetorics and in terms of revolution rhetorics. So, since time's run, uh, I've put all the kind of uh, predicted or the kind of technologies which the experts which were consulted and had consensus talks with each other uh, try to place in each uh, educational uh, landscape. 
please don't read the details. It's, there are gory details here. It's not interesting in se, on sich. What's interesting is to see that it is chaotic, that it is not possible to make full sense of this evolution. You might try to read in the crystal ball, but you are not able. For example, uh, in the gray area, I've put all the rubbish. It means the rubbish here is all the technologies we are deemed to be important in other educational sectors, but which are not in a way uh, identified in this sector as being uh, leading kind of technologies. So we get some nonsensical kind of results which are in a way counterintuitive from experience. That for example games and gamification is not central for the K-12 area. Isn't that crazy? It calls for more research or better methods, in a sense. Or uh, that bring your own device. Have you see how happy children how to bring their Game Boy to school? Even the ones with the glance, glance, build, glance builder? So they get a kind of personal uh, kind of ownership. It's my toy. Or, it's not the fact that you take your iPhone or your iPad at school, it's the, the, the fact that it is your iPad. Bring your own device. Why it is not there, I don't know. Why flip classroom are not identified as a leading technology for K-12, I don't know either. And you can continue this kind of uh, more critical analysis. I might have misread these reports, but I've done actually a quite systematic work comparing the technology which were predicted. So this is a kind of critical view you might have to involve also on reading reports. So I won't use too much time for the technologies here. We don't have the time to do it. For the trends, same thing. I've been uh, looking at the main trend identified and try to put a cross and a gray area for this uh, educational sector. So social media, that's quite funny and counterintuitive, is also a major trend for K-12, but not for higher education, for example. Well, everybody knows that all my students, for example, are on Facebook all the time, even during classes. But the issue is, how is social media identified as a kind of teaching and learning uh, kind of uh, trend uh, for higher education? So you might perhaps uh, here see that social media is not there because university uh, teachers are a bit uh, allergic against uh, using social media in teaching. So you can go through this list. I don't think we have time to go it today. Just look at it from an impressionistic point of view. And uh, these trends might be different in different reports, but this is one of the collection which I've been addressing today. What about the challenges? It is the same. Some challenges are cross-sectoral uh, challenges, like uh, the kind of view that education's own practices limit broader uptake of new technologies. It's a kind of self-bashing uh, approach by educators. While uh, the interest in the digital divide, that's quite funny, is only in a way identified in relation to the college and undergraduate and uh, professional college sector, but not in relation to K-12 or to universities. So probably it's a kind of uh, uh, Spitzperception. Well, to finish off, outlooks, my outlook, my perspective, my minority views. I have to go through, I'm in the wrong slide. Oh, I have to learn to push the right key now. I'm a bit backward. Okay, my perspective. My perspective is that uh, to unify or to simplify or to streamline the approach, I would have to look first at the huge upheavals and changes in post-industrial society concerning the way individuals in Europe and elsewhere today, in a way, shape themselves as individuals. This night process is called, in sociology, the individualization of the individual. It means that people today are constructing their individual profile and they're conscious of themselves rather differently from what they were doing in a more traditional society where all roles were attributed and very much uh, were attributed by sectors. 
So uh, the notion of the evolution of the individual and the processes of individualization are very central in the, for example, the study of the interface or the interaction between the educational world, the cultural world, and the technological world. I think we have to start with humans and, and the path on which humans are today. And there is a huge kind of sociological and anthropological study which address this field. The second point is what I would say, that all these uh, the reports are very nice, but they ignore actually the most disruptive kind of technologies for the future, which are, I call them body near technologies, which interact directly with biology or even the mind. And technologically, we have come very far. And this will have, sooner or later, uh, a very important influence also on computing in general, on networking in general, on social media, but also on, uh, on educational technologies. So we have to be prepared. The third one, and it's referring to the work of the philosopher Roberto Casati, who uh, just published a book in French and in Italian. It will soon, I suppose, be translated into German and English because it's widely popular in France and Italy now. It's called Digital Colonialism, a defense of traditional reading. And I think it's going to the hearts of a lot of teachers in e-learning because it addresses the issue of the opposition and the conflict between what he calls deep reading, focused attention, and immersive reading, as opposed to the short uh, attention span reading, which he called interstitial reading. It's quite difficult. Interstitielle lesung, or something like that in German. So it's this opposition, and it's a huge debate on that, because some people think that uh, Kazati is actually a bit reactionary in this point, that there has never been taking place any deep reading, it's just bullshit, sorry for the word, and that's uh, uh, characterizing uh, digital spaces as a short, uh, short uh, attention span oriented, uh, and that is only Zerstreuung, and it's not immersion, it's very much heavily debated, but this debate is very important uh, for you, and your experiences might be very much, in a way, related to this kind of debate and dilemma also between the two cultures. So I think it's central. It's about the educational philosophy today in school, university and elsewhere. The last, and this is my personal bonus, I would like uh, people to reinvent the Socratic dialogue, the meiotics, the midwife, the kind of birth help for knowledge uh, inside the digital space. We might see some aspects, some fragments of this kind of Socratic dialogue, but there's a long way to go, and it's up to us educators to find ways using technology, perhaps to recreate this kind of relation in learning, which in a way can trigger insights and knowledge in a new way. Last but not least, I think that we have to put more emphasis uh, especially when it comes to technology, on negotiations at all levels. Negotiation with learners, between learners, locally, between decision makers, politicians, between educators, parents, associations and everything. Technology is not about being pushed from above or the side. Its uh, adoption is adoption through negotiations and transactions. So the negotiation dimension, in my view, is fundamental and it needs to be in a way developed uh, very much today. So, danke schön, Liz, Linz ist schön. Thank you. <laughs>